So a couple weeks ago, I asked on my personal Instagram page, what are some of the things that is holding you back from starting up your own online business? And a lot of the answers that came in were actually very, very similar. So some of them are the fear of losing money, the fear of, hey, I have all this money saved up from a nine to five job, and what happens if I dump it into Amazon FBA and then it vanishes due to a failure? Some were concerning things like, oh, I don't know how to do product research, I don't know how to set up a company, et cetera, et cetera. So what I thought I'd do is actually bring on one of the world's leading expert in the mindset game. His name is Elliot Rowe, and he actually works with people that are in the top 10 in the world of their professions and helping them to achieve the number one spot. Some of the people that he has worked with are UFC fighters, Olympians, professional poker players, business titans, and he has a really, really interesting approach when it comes to fixing people's mindset. Because when you are in the number 10 of the world, it's not so much about strategic and tactical things anymore, because those are not the things that are gonna provide you that edge. What is gonna provide you the edge over your competition is all up here, all in the mindset. So I brought him on to do an exclusive interview with my students live, and ultimately helping them to break through their mindset of, hey, what happens if I fail? What if I do this and then do that? It's scary, it's my first business, so on and so forth. So he brings a really, really interesting perspective. Doesn't matter if you're a brand new Amazon seller or someone who's already selling or someone who wants to go from seven to eight figures, I really, really think you'll enjoy this episode of the interview with Elliot Rowe. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Hey, Elliot, how's it going? Yeah, I'm good. How's life? Life is great, man. Life is great. What about you? Yeah, yeah, another good day. Where are you at right now? Salt Lake City. Is that where you live? Yeah, yeah, living in Salt Lake. So uh, up in the mountains, it's not too bad. (laughs) That's awesome. I know you guys are, uh, it's a big ski town. Yeah, it's great. Park City's awesome for it. Maybe I'll pop by this winter with Tony or something. And you'll love it. It's really, really good. That's awesome. Cool. So I guess we can just get started. We'll, we'll jump into it. So we have about 26 people on the call right now. I think there's going to be a few more, hopefully a few more joining us. Don't miss this live opportunity. But just to kind of give everybody a quick, I already wrote them an email, kind of introduce who you are, linked it to your website and everything. So I think most people should already kind of have a good understanding of who you are. Yeah. But I met Elliot, it was early this year. Fe- February time. Yeah, February, February time. time. Yeah, at uh, George Bryan's Mastermind. And yeah, it was super interesting because I used to play a lot of poker and that's how I paid actually through part of my university. And I actually know all these poker players that he works with. And these are the the most elite of the elite, right? They are literally the top of the top. So that was really intriguing. And then basically talking to a couple of my friends, Kayvon, talking to, I just got off a call with Ben. They're like, this is the best money we've ever spent. And they don't say that lightly. So it's really cool what you're doing. And I listened to Mike Diller's podcast as well of you being on there. And he spoke super highly of you after everything that he has gone through. So I thought, you know, I reach out and see if you are willing to help some of our students out because kind of give you a little bit of context as well for those who are on. They've taken my course, a two, two-day two workshop in Vancouver. I try to provide as much value as possible, give them the step-by-step process. And I tell them, I said, hey, this is the easy part. Everybody can come in on a weekend, spend two days with me to learn Amazon FBA. The hard part is the second you walk out the door, what happens after that, right? And life hits us and this hits us, that hits us. And when it comes to Amazon FBA, you do need to make an investment to buy your initial inventory. And a lot of times that is very, very scary to some. And I sent you the screenshots yesterday of asking a lot of people what the number one most fear is. And a lot of people say, hey, I'm scared to lose my the money that I've earned for the past few years that I worked so hard for. So anyway, that's just a quick context. Ellie, do you want to maybe just give everybody a quick introduction of who you are, uh, what you've been doing, um, what people you work with? (laughs) Yeah, so basically, I'm a mindset coach, performance coach. I work with typically people who are at the top of the world, whatever they're doing. So usually it's people who are sort of top 100 looking to become top 10 or top 10 in the world looking to become number one. So that's in sports. So I've worked with UFC champions, Olympians, rugby players, boxers, to name a few. And then in business, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs who are looking to reach that next level. And also um, guys on Wall Street, people like that who are, who are struggling 
struggling with stress in their environment and need to perform at their best. And then, as you mentioned, a big part of my business is professional poker, where I've been lucky enough to work with some of the best players in the world for around the last probably seven or eight years. I've been working with that sort of level of poker player where it's millions of dollars on the line virtually every time they play. So the, the concept that I use and, and the direction I'm coming from is hypnotherapy. So I'm a hypnotherapist by trade. And what I'm what I look to, to show people is that throughout your life, you're just running programs that you learned in childhood. And in order to see something change, you need to adjust those programs that have been learned. So, um, I mean, almost everything that you sent me on that list, Tom, was clearly just um, self-sabotage and fear of failure. So this is the one that you've, <laughs> it comes up with everyone, but sort of in the, in the answers that you were giving and all of those screenshots, everything's linked to fear of failure and sometimes fear of success as well. They can be very linked. So so what do you mean by what can you explain a little bit in depth about fear of self sabotaging a failure like what does that mean Okay so um basically I think we all see it to some extent in our lives where there's something we know that we should be doing but for some reason we can't bring ourselves to do it so we're trying to follow a diet and we decide to break our diet plan. The classic one in business that I see is the sales call that they know they're supposed to make, but they choose for some reason that always gets put to the back of the list and they miss it. And then two weeks later, it's too embarrassing to phone up the potential client. So the lead has been missed or the meeting or whatever it might be. So it's these moments in life where you're creating barriers for yourself. So the barrier that you've shown me in, in the things from your clients here is the barrier of if you don't try, it's impossible to fail. And, and that's what I really got a sense of in those emails and those messages. Yeah, well, what happens if I invest my money here and it doesn't work out? It's like, okay, what happens if you continue with your life as it is? And at some point, you're going to have to invest your time or your money in something new if you want to have different results. And is there a chance that you make a mistake and you burn through the initial investment that you make? Yeah, of course there is. But it's seeing that that's not really the end of the game then. That's now new information to use to then make a better investment next time, learn from your mistakes, perhaps talk to you and get some more advice as to what went wrong. And I, I think usually it's some kind of ego defense. And I see it even with really, really high performers. Everyone's self-sabotaging on some level. If you don't give 100%, you can always tell yourself you would have been successful. If you give 100% and it doesn't work out, you have to admit to yourself you did something wrong, and that's a scarier place for people to be. So I think what, what you're describing here and what we were seeing is just a lot of people feeling that very natural discomfort of, if I do buy this stock, if I do get going in Amazon uh, marketing, then I'm basically, I'm putting a flag in the air and saying, I'm here, I'm trying this, I'm trying to make something happen. And you're going to weave up, you're either going to make money or you're going to fail at that. And it's binary. It's going to be one of those things. And that's a scary place to be. If you say, oh, I went on a course, I learned all about it, but I'm not quite sure yet. You stay in the zone where you can pretend to yourself you would have 100% been successful if you'd given it 100%. And as I say, I think that's the sort of theme that I was seeing in those in those answers. And as I say, it's incredibly natural for everyone, not just not just people in this industry. I see it in professional athletes who don't quite train as hard as they should. I see it in Wall Street traders who aren't following their own rules. Basically, everyone giving themselves an out of saying, if I'd chosen to try, I would have succeeded, but I'm choosing not to even try, and therefore I'm in control. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess the money question is, how do we overcome that? <laughs> um, I think the first is being aware that that's what's going on. Right. Okay. So it's just having that background awareness of what am I really protecting myself from here? And having a look at what your life is right now. And if you're happy with your life in your nine to five, or if you're not, and if, if you're completely content and you're happy and you've got savings and you don't want to take that risk, then maybe it was an interesting weekend course for you. You understand a bit more about Amazon marketing and you're not going to go in that direction. But if you're not happy in your current employment, there is going to have to be a risk of time or risk of money to change that situation. And it's time to sort of step back from the ego side of it of saying, what if I fail? What if it doesn't work out? To going, I'm going to accept that there is a chance. It's always just, you know, some percentage of the time there's going to be success and some percentage is going to be failure. And you're willing to take that risk. 
and then learn from the mistakes, try again, learn from the mistakes, try again. One of the themes I see in very successful people is this willingness to fail and just see it as information, useful information, seeing it as feedback, and then just jumping straight back in the ring again, jumping straight back in the ring again. When people fail once, I mean, if you, you're going to fail throughout your business career if you're an entrepreneur. Like it's going to happen. You don't have a smooth ride. I'm sure you've seen that as well, Tom, with people. Like it's not just a straight trajectory up the whole way through. So you have to be prepared that, yeah, there's going to be some risk. But if you see this as, I'm going to keep trying until I solve this, it's very likely you're going to have a very different life in three or four years versus the life if you just stay in your nine to five and keep it very, very low risk. So it's sort of making those decisions and those choices, knowing where you are in life and really having a vivid picture of where you want to be in five years and say, okay, well, if I stay where I am and don't take any risks, is there any chance of me being there? And in most cases, I'd say there probably isn't in the way that wages normally increase in a normal job. Right. And one of the things that I've learned from listening to a lot of podcasts that you're featured on and whatnot, is that you, what you said at the initially, it says, all of our experiences right now serving us as adults all can be tied back to when we're a child. You said between the age of three to six, I believe. Yeah, that's it? that's typically where the very the sort of the initial sensitizing event comes in, and then we have other events we call secondary sensitizing events that that then happen from that age up to about fifteen years old, and then other. They then, as you become an adult, the events have to be far more traumatic to have that issue. And that's where you see things like PTSD. So if something incredibly traumatic happens, then there's something else that can shift the way that you view the world. But as a as sort of three to three to seven, usually, very subtle things can impact the way that you're working within the world. And then as you get older, it has to be more and more extreme as it goes through. Got it. And one thing I also want to say, bring this up is when I first heard the word hypnosis, I thought you're going to have a little clock in front of watch, me. Yeah. yeah, a little watch. <laughs> making me a call. Can you just clear people? Can you just tell people like it's not that and what it actually is? <laughs> yeah. So stage hypnotherapy doesn't do us any favors in this part of the industry. So stage hypnotherapy is a show. It's done to look good. And it, 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 very few people can be successfully hypnotized in that way. It's a lot of social pressure and things that make those shows work. The work that I do is hypnotherapy. So the best way of describing it is if anyone's done meditation in the past. So if you've listened to Headspace or any of the other apps, it's like a guided meditation, but it's meditation with a purpose. So as you get to that very relaxed state, instead of sort of just a allowing your mind to drift and then focusing on your breath as it does, which is with a meditation. You're sort of looking to notice when your mind wanders and then bring it back into focus. You're actually looking to use that same state to focus in on a specific area or a specific issue. So let's say it's anxiety, or in this case, fear of failure, self-sabotage, whatever it might be. And then as we explore those, those areas within the hypnotherapy, it brings up memories in, from the past in a way that they wouldn't be brought up in a normal conversation. So people start talking about things that happened to them when they were in their childhood, early teens, that they didn't necessarily remember before the session, but they're coming up and they talk about them in quite a lot of detail. And you usually start to see these really obvious narratives as to why someone might be sabotaging in that way. So a classic one around money is we start talking about why there's this fear of investing and this fear of creating a business or whatever it might be. And they'll start talking about their parents not liking rich people and saying that rich people don't deserve the money or that they're greedy or whatever it might be, any labels that they, they were listening to in childhood. And as a child, that then seeps in and it creates some level of fear that they won't be accepted if they become financially successful. So then these, these sort of become, they, they end up with this level of what, what will be a, an acceptable amount of wealth for them. And, you know, I've spoken to people where that's 50,000 in the bank, where that's 100,000, some people it's a million, some people it's more, but there's very often some level that they believe is acceptable for them to be allowed to have. And we need to work through that so that it's unlocked because obviously you can imagine that if you've got a very low set thermostat for that, then you're going to keep dragging yourself back to that level time and time again. And anytime an opportunity comes up that can change that, you'll find excuses and reasons to self-sabotage yourself. So we, we work through those memories, we work through those emotions. So in that instance, we'd look at it from the outside and we'd say, okay, if you're an adult watching this meal with your parents and that young child, what does it look like to you? 
And you would say, probably there are a couple of adults there who are jealous that they haven't been that financially successful. And they're trying to explain to their child why they don't have their swimming pool that the friend, child's friend does. So they're putting down the friend's parents to make them feel better and try and make the child feel better that they're coming from a poorer family. So, and then as you start to see the logic, as you start to unwind all of it, it becomes, oh, this was my parents just trying to make themselves feel more comfortable rather than this is true that all rich people are bad or whatever narrative that was created. And as you overcome that coming out of the session, suddenly the money doesn't seem quite so scary and you can deal with it in a different way. And as I say, it's the same if it's an anxiety or anger issues, like all of all of these things just learn. In my own case, I had a fear of flying. I became a hypnotherapist because a hypnotherapist cured my fear of flying. And it was that as a, as a young child, I'd been told about a plane crash that there was some potential my, my granddad would have been in the plane. That made me believe that flying was really dangerous. The truth of it was, it was something you probably shouldn't have told a three-year-old. <laughs> and, um, and once I'd sort of resolved this and worked through it and released the emotion, it, flying wasn't scary anymore because it became rational. But until that point, it was really quite, you know, I, I would put off trips and things like that because I didn't want to get on the plane. It changed my life. And because it changed my life, I jumped into this industry and then it changed my life again, taking my, my path in a completely different direction. I actually want to talk to you about that because I heard that in Mike Dillard's podcast of you sharing that story. I actually hate flying. Okay. Yeah. I absolutely hate flying. I'm getting better, hmm. noticeably a lot better. But exactly what you said, right? You will go on vacation and days before the vacation, you will think about flying. When you get yeah, to that I, destination, you think about coming back. You know you're, getting, you know you're getting on the plane on the way. <laughs> yeah, I, know exactly, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. But for me, well, I'm only scared of flying when I get on the plane. And then once the plane, once the, the air stewardess comes out with the train and everything, I'm like mm-hmm. completely fine and landing is fine. It's just taking off. That's like really scary. I started sitting actually close to the aisle now that I'm not on the window seats anymore. So I can look outside and that's been better. And that reduces the stress. I mean, and that, that might tell you it's partially a control issue because by you having the control of choosing your seat and saying, well, I feel better if I'm in this position, you're feeling like you're taking more control over the process. So another one with fear fear of flying is it's quite often just control. One of the questions I always ask people who have an issue with flying is, would you feel safer if it was you flying the plane? And I'll be honest, in the past, I would have always said, yeah, I'd feel quite comfortable. If it was me in the seat, yeah, that's fine. I don't know how to fly a plane, but I would feel more comfortable if I was up the front with the pilot. And I think it's this, you know, a lot of people with control issues end up with um, struggling with things like flying. So. Yeah, yeah. And even like when I'm, uh, I, I like driving, like I want to yeah. be the driver. I don't yeah, want anybody yeah. else to drive. <laughs> That's me. Like I'm, I'm driving the car. Even if it's not my car, I'll be like, I'll always offer. I'd be like, Hey, you mind? <laughs> hey, I, I can drive your car. Can like, I test right? it? Yeah. Can like, I? <laughs> what do you mean you want to drive my car? I'm thinking of buying one of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, but I, I'm trying to think if it's yeah. I guess like we got to do deeper work in order to find if it's a childhood thing or a. I mean, it, it will be it'll be a collection of things. There will either be traumatic incidents, like I've had some people where it's been they've been in a plane and the engine's blown up, and since that point they've had a fear of flying, it's quite clear where that came from. But usually with control issues, there are other things that, that end up popping up within a session. And yeah, it's, it's the sort of thing we can't really do right now. But if we were working on that, you would notice these themes start to show and then you work through those themes and um, it just becomes easier than it was before. That understood. So we talked about this already in terms of being aware, in terms of saying, hey, it's a lot. And, and that makes a lot of sense, right? And for those who just joined, there's 53 of us in this room right now. But and again, you guys are all my local students here in Vancouver. We have Elliot, mental coach that works with literally the top of the top 10. You, what you said perfectly is, hey, I work with people that are number 10 in the world that are trying to get to number one, right? So that's the type of clients that he work with. So he brings a really, really amazing insight that not a lot of us are exposed to. So it's great that Elliot is sharing these things with us. And so you, you already told us, you said, hey, I don't want to do the... So I took... I'm not Tom. Let's say I'm Jerry. Jerry took Tom's course because he was really interested in Amazon. He was hungry. He knows that what he wants to be in five years is not working a nine to five anymore, but he took Tom's course. And after taking Tom's course, he feels really excited, really motivated, and he sees a whole new world of possibilities that open up to him. But for some reason, he's not allowing himself to launch his first product because self-sabotaging of failure or success. I would rather, I don't want to prove to myself or other people that I might be wrong. That's pretty much yeah. what you're saying, correct? Yeah, generally. 
I mean, so for each individual, yeah, yeah. it'll be slightly different. Right. But generally, it will be once that trigger is pulled, you're either going to succeed in it or you're going to fail. Before you pull that trigger, you can tell all of your friends that you're going to go into this work and you're going to be rich and it's all going to work out and you're doing the training you don't actually have to test yourself and you don't actually find out. So you get a lot of the positive, oh, that sounds really interesting. Oh, you went on the course, that's really good. Like, So you get a lot of the positive reinforcement from everyone around you, but you don't actually have to take the step out of the plane and find out what's, if that parachute is going to open or not. So this is a thing that, as I say, I think it holds a lot of people back because it goes from being something interesting to talk about to this is real life, it's real work, you're going to have to put in effort, there are going to be bad days, there are going to be products that don't work out, there are going to be products that do work out, and all of that is part of the life of an entrepreneur. And some people aren't quite ready for that, or they're, as I say, there are these sort of, I usually describe it as a, a feeling of an invisible force field holding you back from doing those things. And what I would say, as I recommend this technique a lot, Really have a think about the feeling that's holding you back in those moments. So some people feel sick. Some people feel a pressure in their chest. Some people get headaches. Some people, like I said, it's it's not even really describable. It just feels like a force field. Like they just can't do this or just can't get themselves to the gym or whatever it might be. And then sit down and write down a list of the other times in your life you felt that way. So a classic example of this sort of self-sabotage where it's not wanting to jump in and do the work is being at school, being a clever kid in class, and not wanting to study for exams. So they don't want to study because they're going to do okay if they don't study. But if they're going to study, they're going to find out how well they'll really do versus everyone else. So they can sort of tell themselves that they're really clever because, hey, if I studied, I probably would have got the best grade. But I chose not to study. And in this case, it's, hey, if I launched a product, I'd probably be rich but I've chosen not to launch a product, therefore I'm in control. And people aren't consciously aware of this. They're not thinking I'm choosing not to do it to be in control, but they're just following where their comfort zone is. And by following the comfort zone, they stay exactly where they are, but they've got a cool thing to talk about to their friends with zero risk other than whatever they've spent in terms of going to the course or learning around the subject. And the truth is, it's with almost anything, you can only get so much information until all that matters is experience. So there's only so much someone can learn before what they really need to do is jump. It's like you can teach someone to swim on dry land, but the truth is they're going to have to get in the pool at some stage. They're not going to swim perfectly. They're going to have to get in the pool and decide that they want to be someone who can swim. And this is how it needs to be viewed with these sorts of businesses. If you want to get into this, you, there's no time like the present. Jump in, swim, see how you do, get the feedback, learn. And as I say, we've all got friends who spoke, talked about the business they're going to launch for five years, and they're never going to launch the business. (laughs) And what you're describing just sounds very similar to me, to that sort of process. Yeah, for sure. So that's one of the things where I tell people at the end of my workshop, I say, hey, look, like it is going to take some time to launch your first product because you need to find the product, you need to source it from China, you need to get some samples, and sometimes people lose momentum. But what I want you to do today is I want you to just go on a, this website called AliExpress, buy just 10 units of anything that you want, get it to your house for $50. So that's not a financial risk at all, $50. And then send it into Amazon, create your first Amazon listing, take some photos on your iPhone. And these are all the things you can do for free. But at least you've kind of jumped into the pool with the system. And, and I would say, if you have a look at the difference of successes from people who bothered to do that straight after your course, and the people who don't, I would be sure that the people who've invested just $50 are massively more likely to then go on and turn that into a proper business. Because like you say, they've dipped their toes in the shallow end. They've sort of taken that first step. They've seen their name next to a listing on Amazon. They've answered potential questions that have come up from clients and all of it. It's become tangible. It's become real. Until that first step happens, it's just an interesting hobby to talk about, you know, and and, it, and it's sort of switching between, you know, what do you really want in five years? And realistically, most people, if they've come on your course, I would assume they're coming on because they want to be living a dramatically different life in five years rather than the life that they're living currently. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we all have goals, ambitions, and we all know life can be better and we all deserve better. But how do you get there? And a lot of it is just 
you are your worst enemy. I mean, do you deserve better if you won't take the risk, though? No. <laughs> do you know? Yeah, and that's. I mean, I mean, it might be slightly harsh, but if you deserve better if you're willing to take action and take risks right. and, and move on these things. If you're not willing to take those risks, then you can't expect things to change because mm-hmm. it, it is just not possible. If you want to get stronger, you have to go to the gym. If you want to make money, you have to do something different, more money. You have to do something different to what you're doing today because you're probably p- being paid the value that you're worth to whatever job you're in or, or what have you right now. Yeah, right. So, I, I think, I think instead of saying deserve, I mean the ability to, Oh, the ability I mean, to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what I meant. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Not, there's no handoffs in this world and you have to, you do have to work for it, especially in business because every day it is you against yourself. And especially in the e- this e-commerce business, because it's just a computer and yourself, right? It's not like you're working in an office space, but hopefully we'll get one soon. I'm trying to start like an incubator in Vancouver to awesome. get yeah, to get all my students locally to work out of, it's actually Tony Yu's old office. So I'm picking up his Oh, crap. awesome. He's sharing his office with two other companies and they're mm-hmm. expanding rapidly and they're outgrowing their office. So I'm probably going to take it over, turn it into a really cool Amazon FBA incubator just for my local students where they get access to me and all these cool things. And that way, the environment that I'm trying to create, well, I think will help some people to accelerate their process as well. Well, also you'll be in a situation where it's going to be very hard to hide if you're the only person in the office who's not not doing the work. So that yeah, that sort of thing, that can be really useful. So the sorts of things that you can you can try and do. So all of you are in this group. There's these, I mean, it's a huge number. 56 people have turned up. Get together in small groups. Two or three people hold each other accountable. Set a target. Okay, all three of us have said in two weeks we're going to have done what Tom said and ordered fifty dollars worth of product from whichever site you mentioned. You know, set get into small groups, hold each other accountable very seriously. And that accountability is another way of driving yourself past these sorts of self-sabotage issues. Right. And you think a lot of people like, especially now in the world of social media, I feel like we all, we put our best moments out there. Mm -hmm. We don't want others, we're vulnerable to the moments where like we don't want to be vulnerable to the world in a sense that we don't want others to see, oh, like we failed or we had a bad day or whatever. So do you think a lot of this, this holding back, this fear is essentially... Like, for example, like one of my students, I remember this vividly. She's like, I don't want to, I'm scared of doing this because what if I did all that work and then at the end, nothing comes out of it, right? Do you think a lot of that would be yeah. kind of, um, has to do with like our perception of other people th- thought of us? Like, oh, this- oh, complete uh, other people and yourself because mm. you feel like, oh, I wasn't good enough. I wasted this time. I could have been doing whatever else it she could have been doing in that time. But like I said, it's, and you'll understand this more because of the poker background, but everything you do in life is there's a percentage chance of success and a percentage chance of failure. And even if you do all of that work and that particular thing fails, it doesn't mean you did it wrong. It doesn't mean that it was a bad choice. It could have been a really really good decision. I mean, we would call it plus EV, expected value decision. And that's just the way the world works. What I would really, anyone who is feeling that way, what if I do this and it doesn't generate me money? Ask yourself, what happens if you don't do this? I mean, and what would you have done with those hours if are you going to be at the gym getting super healthy, improving your life? Did it, or are you going to be watching shows on Netflix? If the answer is you would have been watching shows on Netflix, does it really matter if you just learned a lot and you didn't make money from it? Because that information is valuable, maybe to yourself, maybe to other people from what you learned, you're going to be more interesting to talk to. It's going to open up another form of socializing for you. So it's sort of seeing all of the other effects that come from putting a lot of effort into something and that the financial gain from an individual product probably isn't very relevant compared to the sort of growth that you're going to have from putting yourself out there and actually trying to follow a system like this and testing yourself and seeing if you have the potential to make the millions of dollars that some people do. Right. Because that is just the end result. We have to be focusing on the the different parts. If you make the right decision for every single step along the way, you will have a more chance of getting to that end goal. But the end goal does not like, I, I guess, yeah, like going back to poker terms, right? Like aces versus kings. It's not like you play the hand bad or anything like that. It's just sometimes shit sometimes happens. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> shit happens, right? So 
but yeah, but you no. still learn. I mean, and that's yeah. it's like there's still there's still learning going on. So anyone who thinks, "What if I try and I fail?" Well, how much does that trying mean to you as a person? The fact that you were able to take a risk, you were able to try and start a business. What does that mean for your potential in the future for starting new businesses? I think it's those sorts of gains you have to be looking at, and they really add up over time. And if you just continue and you're nine for five and you don't take any of these risks and you don't put effort into anything else out of hours, just literally nothing can change. It's not possible to change. And, and that's the way I would sort of be hoping that it that would help people to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Awesome. So Elliot, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I, I really appreciate you coming on and kind of talk to us. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we, uh, you know, before you kick me off, <laughs> I, I got, um, yeah, no, I got no, someone no. else. I got someone else coming on at uh, four thirty. Yeah, yeah. so you gotta, you gotta go, man. I've got to jump. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think I covered much most of the mindset stuff that I think is important. I do have an app you can download for free with sort of guided meditations that will help with motivation and things like that. It's called Primed Mind. You can try it for free. There's loads of there's about forty free audios on there, and you can extend it to two hundred free two hundred if you pay. But there'll be a lot. It'll give you an idea of the sort of work I do. And if any of this is really resonated with with people and they're worried about oh I feel that invisible force field I'm struggling, look for a hypnotherapist in your area or a therapist is to work through these things it is almost impossible it won't be good good value for money if you resolve that problem and it's holding you back from starting a business that could be a decision that's worth hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for you see it as something that's workable and resolvable rather than just something that paralyzes you but yeah that's my that, that's sort of cool. all my info there really tom so awesome and you also have a podcast as well correct yeah, so I've got a podcast. It's called the A Game Advantage Podcast, and we have sort of high performers coming on and talking about their mindset and how they've reached the top in the world and whatever they've done. So, yeah, that's on iTunes as well. So, yeah, go and check that out. Awesome. So it's called the Primed Mind. Sorry, can- so the app, the app on the iStore is called Primed Mind. Shall I stick it in chat? Actually, is that is that easier? There you go. Oh, I've lost you, Tom. I, I think you're on silent. Oh no, I'm here. Okay. Oh. Awesome. So, do actually do you have time to like for a few questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. no problem. Guys, who wants to ask Elliot a question? And don't ask him anything about Amazon related, okay? Uh, yeah, I know nothing about. Don't know anything about Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. You can, ask me, you can ask me about that. It's like, so what type of products these? No, it doesn't sell on Amazon. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? If you feel like it's a little bit too long to type, and I can unmute you as well, just let me know. Just type something, be like on mute, and I'll unmute you. What about the, okay, let's answer a couple here. What about the inability to make decisions? Okay. So again, it's exactly the same thing. So why aren't you making decisions? Okay. It's because more likely than not, you're scared that you're going to make a wrong decision. Why are you scared that you're going to make a wrong decision? Because that will potentially lead to failure. And what does it mean about you if you've made a bad decision? So again, start looking at self-confidence. Why? It might be uncomfortable for you to feel like you made a mistake. Why you may have perfectionist feelings about different parts of your life. You know, that's one of the things that might have come up. And again, start to work through those things. Start to look at the feeling you have when you have to make a decision. Write down where else in your life that happened. And then as you've written down those stories, start to look at how realist, you know, should you have really been listening to those people? Should you take school bullying seriously? or Whatever it might have been that made you feel that way. And as you work through that, you'll start to notice some of these changes. If it's paralyzing you, like I say, find find someone in your area who you can talk to and and they'll be able to help um, with that sort of thing. So, so yeah, sort of speak to a professional if it's really serious, but go through that process I described. I think that'll be very powerful for you. Cool. And then I think procrastination is the same thing, right? As the inability to make decisions. Uh, pretty much, yeah. It's people getting in their own way, finding excuses. Again, it's about sort of really making yourself resp- taking responsibility that this is something it's saying you want to do the procrastination is a wonderful excuse to you know oh i'm just lazy no you're choosing not to do this everything is just about choice you like being in control and you like your control to say that i don't have to do these things and that's absolutely fine but don't expect success if you don't do what successful people are doing so really change that sort of mindset that way yeah and i also want i also want to share something with you guys last night i was driving home i had the i had two options I was going to go home and read books, uh, which I'm trying to get myself to do more. The other option was actually for me to come home and I was going to go play poker at the casino. I still play poker like very, very like once in a blue moon kind of thing. So how I came about, ended up at home reading books is 
I basically, as I was driving home, I'm like, okay, so I have these two decisions to make. First things first, it's my choice to make those decisions. Like no one, it's no one else's choice. It's my choice to make those decisions. And then I almost put myself as a third party, like looking at this from a very rational perspective. It's like, okay, what do you think is going to benefit your life more? By reading this book at home or going to the casino to play poker? And then I was like, duh, obviously going home to read. And then from there, just like, okay, well, I should probably go home and read. And then I just like, yeah, I, I, I made that decision. Let's answer two more questions. Anita says, do you utilize positive affirmations and visualization daily? Um, yeah. So again, that's basically what the app is about. So the app can't go into personal histories. It's listening to me. So a lot of that is positive affirmations, visualizations of success, all of those sorts of things. So check out the app. There's a lot of that work and you get to listen listen to me talk to you for hours. <laughs> cool. And then some. Oh, I, I almost feel sometimes like it's paralyzing with all my options. I have difficulty focusing and narrowing it down one thing, not for Amazon, but for life as well. Start writing all of them down, James, I would say, and start Really, just sometimes if two things seem 50-50, just toss a coin. She's one of them. doesn't matter so long as you're doing something. And then if it doesn't work out, move on quickly. Fail fast. I'm stealing that from somebody else, but it, it is true. You're better off trying something, failing at it quickly, and then learning from it than getting stuck in this, you know, should I do this or this or this? Like, there are infinite products on Amazon. I do have some clients who've, who've worked in this area. But you're not going to find the one best product on Amazon. There's going to be, you know, there's, there are infinite products, effectively. Choose one that seems good enough and then just jump into it and learn your lessons and then jump into the next one. It's getting started is going to be the main thing. Yeah, write it down for sure. That's huge. I have this free app on my computer. It's called, I recently downloaded this. It's called Workflowy. It was recommended by one of my employees, ex-student. Workflowy, it's free. I literally just put everything in my brain. I dump it on here as a checklist every day and I just go boom, off, done, done, done. And I feel really good about it after I finish too. So write it all down. And then from there, you just feel like your brain, it's, there's more room in your brain to actually make decisions instead of these things in your head that you're, yeah, anyway, just dump it all in. And then we'll just do one last question. And then okay. that's, uh, yeah. So by uh, Rick. Okay, so Rick. Hey, great hearing from you today. In your experience, do a lot of the clients you coach have more of an internal locus of control in their life? I don't know if this is sort of bef- before they work with me or after. The truth is everyone is everyone's fighting their own battles and everyone is just on... It, it, when you say, do they have more, it's more than who. And the truth is that it's just whether you're battling to make your first 100,000, your first million, your first 10 million, your first 100 million, there's just at some stage, a level of resistance comes up from everybody. And it's almost identical. The issues, the things I'm talking about, whether someone's one of the best in the world, or if they're just starting out in business, they're going to be talking about how they were brought up by the parents, whether they felt loved by their mom and dad, how badly they were bullied at school, whether they failed in exams, how it felt when they got rejected the first time they asked a girl out or first time a guy dumped them if it was a female. These sorts of things, and it, it's they shape everybody. We just end up at different parts, diff, in different places, and then at some stage these things come up in one way or another and then we, we have to res- resolve them to get that control in our life. So it's not like top performers all have everything in place. They're just fortunate enough that they've got enough control in those areas and obviously enough determination to do most of the right things. But even people who are top 10 in the world, often if I ask them, what's the guy who's number one doing that you're not doing? They'll give me a list. And I'll say, okay, well, how can you know that he's doing this stuff and you're not doing it if you say you want to be number one in the world? And as they start to see it that way, then things start to really change because it's like, okay, if I know someone else is doing more, if I want to compete, if I want to be doing better, I have to be doing at least what they're doing. Otherwise, I've got to accept it's my choice not to do that and I'm choosing to not be as successful. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Well, that was, I hope you guys really got a lot of value. This is obviously something that is very different than the stuff that I teach you in terms of tactical and, and, and strategic, but I truly believe that it's equally as important without the right mindset. You won't have a successful business without the right strategies or tactics. You won't have a successful business either. So the both are very, very intermingled and linked. So okay. um, I've got, I've got one last challenge for your people, Tom. Yeah. If you, if you've come on here, 
and sort of spent an hour listening to us, make it an absolute minimum that tonight you invest $50 and buy those products because you've just invested an hour. So you may well invest 50 bucks and start that process. Make that the absolute minimum next step is you'll dip your toes in the water. I think that it could be life-changing. So at a very minimum, if you finish this call, get on there, do the $50 and see how you feel after that point where it suddenly become real rather than just imaginary for you. I love that challenge. And I have a screenshot of everybody who's attending this call. <laughs> so I want you guys to, go, again, go on AliExpress, buy $50 worth of something, one product, two product, 10 products, get it shipped to your house, send it into Amazon. You got to print an effing SKU. You got to do the listing and everything. Take some photos. Again, this is not going to make you hundreds and thousands of hundreds of dollars, but this is going to get you dip your feet into the water for you to feel like, wow, this is what water feels like instead of keep watching YouTube videos and, you know, uh, doing research. So do that. And then that's it. So guys, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Elliot. Actually, I do have a question for you after just literally one quick question. I, maybe I'll just like message you on Instagram or something. That's probably okay. Easy. Cool. Yeah. Just drop but, me a line. Yeah, I will. And again, guys, check out Elliot's podcast is www.primed mind.com. It's free. If you like it, you can download, get the paid version. I'm going to do that myself as well today and check out his podcast as well. And other than that, that's pretty much it. So thank you so much, Elliot, again, for joining us. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Hey, thank you so much for watching till the end of this video. Really hope you got a lot of value from this. And if you are interested in watching more, make sure you're subscribed to this channel. And if you're seeing it till the end, give your boy a thumbs up and leave a comment in the comment section down below. And I will see you in the next video.